What's up everyone, welcome back to another What If video. We haven't touched upon this What If in a while, but surprisingly, we're already nearing the end of it, and are about to get towards the end of Dragon Ball Super. It's been a bit since part 4, so here's a little recap. Battle of Gods and Resurrection F went very smoothly, with a lot less trouble than usual. Cell also has joined Goku and Vegeta in their training with Beerus. Following these arcs, we left off the last part with the selection of the members for Team Universe 7 in the Tournament of Destroyers. This time around, the team has Goku, Vegeta, and Piccolo as usual, but now has Cell and surprisingly Lapis on top of that. With that recap out of the way, let's move on. Before the fight, Goku and Vegeta head into the Room of Spirit in time like normal in order to train some more beforehand. After the time passes, the tournament itself begins. The order of the Universe 6 fighters remains the same, there's no reason for it to really change. While the order for Universe 7 goes as follows, Goku, Piccolo, Lapis, Vegeta, and finally, Cell. The fights between Goku and Batamo and Goku and Frost go like normal, as does the one with Piccolo and Frost. No need to really cover it in depth since they're the same. Following Piccolo's defeat, Lapis is now up against Frost. Everyone knows about the Poison Needles by this point, but I mean, Lapis doesn't really seem like one who would care about that, and he's up to fight Frost anyways. In terms of power and skill, Frost is greatly outmatched here. Lapis's android physiology, his techniques, and his strength all outmatch Frost, basically in every field. And Lapis is able to outmaneuver the Space Pirate pretty easily. Frost gets angered with his attacks not landing, and Lapis doesn't really want to deal with Frost's hissy fit. As soon as Frost loses his cool, Lapis uses it as an opening to attack. With only a few hits, Frost is suddenly knocked out of the ring and defeated. Lapis gets a flawless victory against Frost, without a scratch on him. Went pretty well. Since 17 in the regular story is able to keep up with Super Saiyan Blue Goku when they first fought, I'm going to assume that Lapis is just beneath where Goku and Vegeta are at the moment, since those two are stronger in this scenario, and since he's an android with the infinite energy engine, Lapis can fight at full power without worrying about his stamina or energy loss, so he was basically at full power against Frost here the entire time. He doesn't need to worry about pacing himself or whatever. That's only something those pesky humans and Saiyans need to worry about, and I guess Namekians and Cell and whatever other races are present. Anyways, next, the android is up against Megeta. Megeta tries to suffocate Lapis out of the arena, but Lapis is able to find his weakness and take care of him before he does lose too much oxygen. He may have infinite energy and stamina, but that doesn't mean Lapis can't be suffocated in a situation like this. He still takes battle damage and stuff like that, and obviously, the infinite energy engine isn't going to save him from not having oxygen. But since his stamina doesn't drain, being suffocated here by Megeta's heat attack means that Lapis would most likely be able to get back to full power once he catches his breath. It's just not a condition that he wants to be fighting in the entire time. But obviously it's better than if he were a normal human, because if that were the case, then he would be out of breath and would have suffered significant stamina loss. Now, Lapis faces Kaba. Kaba is a kind-hearted guy, surprising for a Saiyan to say the least and Lapis doesn't go too hard on him since this kid seems respectful, but Lapis does still win with little trouble. That means there's two big differences here, one being that Vegeta and Kaba don't form their master and student bond like usual, and as a side effect of that, that means Kaba doesn't get Super Saiyan or even learn about it existing, which will have effects later on in the Tournament of Power. Finally, Lapis is up against Hit. Lapis has swept everyone so far except for Batamo, who he didn't fight, so he's a little cocky here, but he still thinks relatively clearly. He's surprised to see how strong Hit actually is once he tries to attack him. Lapis pulls out all his techniques and is using his full power like before, using barriers, key blasts, all of that. With Hit's time skip being good against close range melee attacks, Lapis sees one option that he could use in order to trip Hit up. Similar to what he did against Jiren late in the Tournament of Power after he was revealed to be still alive, Lapis rushes towards Hit and creates a barrier around the both of them, charging up a massive key blast and quickly jumping back. Hit may have his time skip, but in a barrier like this with an attack surrounding him, it's not something he's going to be able to escape from. Lapis jumps back and his attack did land and deal some damage, but not enough. And it did also damage Lapis himself. But still, he was able to get a couple scratches and burns on Hit. It wasn't a particularly strong attack, because he didn't want himself to be killed. But it was still enough to injure both of them considerably and noticeably. However, before he even knows it, Hit sends a blast of pressurized air towards Lapis, which knocks the android out of the ring. Hit is actually kind of injured from Lapis' attack like I mentioned, as is Lapis, but Hit can still fight. Plus, his time skip hasn't improved very much since his fight with Lapis was very very short in comparison to what it was against Goku, and this is good because Vegeta's up against him next. I will say Hit did improve though, but at most, I would estimate it's only about a tenth of a second and not something crazy like a half second. 
Vegeta faces Hit now and knows all about the time skip after watching it against the Lapis, so all he has to do is figure out a way to work around it. Lapis helped out Vegeta a lot by weakening Hit as well, meaning Hit is more susceptible to attacks right now. Not to mention, Vegeta is stronger in this scenario due to his training with Beerus being more effective since Cell is there as well, but most importantly, Hit made a fatal flaw. He explained that he improved against Lapis, even though it wasn't by very much, and that he keeps improving as fights go on. Doing so lets Vegeta realize that he has to handle Hit kinda quickly. Vegeta knows Hit's ability, how it works, and how it'll prove if he drags the fight on too long. Plus, Hit has been weakened here and Vegeta is stronger than normal. All of those factors combined means Vegeta has a huge upper hand here. Being the master strategist that he is, Vegeta realizes that the best way to counter Hit's time skip is to be unpredictable and basically attack at random. Hit knows what move Vegeta will make next, but if Vegeta himself erratically changes his movements when attacking, not even knowing himself how he's going to attack, then Hit won't be able to do as well against Vegeta. Vegeta goes to his maximum power output and attacks Hit. He trips Hit up by using predictable moves first and dodging Hit's counters, but then he catches Hit off guard by using very erratic movements. Hit is completely caught off guard, and this is a good opportunity for Vegeta. Hit is basically stunned now, so Vegeta can pull off a combo, and he has to make it quick. Vegeta is able to knock Hit in the air with a few kicks and punches, and before Hit even realizes it, Vegeta has jumped up far above him and is charging an attack. Hit tries to brace himself, but he's mid-air so he can't really do anything to maneuver around it. Vegeta fires a final flash that launches Hit out of the arena, into the ground outside of it. Hit moves his arms from his face and realizes that he was able to actually block the attack, but then he looks down at the ground and realizes that he's not in the arena. He was too focused on blocking the attack and trying to counter Vegeta, but it didn't work at all. Hit places his hands back in his pocket, and gives off a little chuckle. He'd be lying if he said that wasn't impressive what Vegeta just pulled off. Vegeta has defeated Hit, and Universe 7 has won. Cell didn't even get to fight, sadly, but he had his fun against Frieza in the last part, so this is kind of fair. It lets Vegeta get a little bit of a chance to shine. The tournament concludes like normal, and now we get head into the future Trunks arc. But oh no, it's not Goku Black this time. And it's not Vegeta Black either. This time, it's something unique and different, but it's probably one of my stupidest, headcanon-ridden, craziest ideas yet. But I want to spice things up instead of doing Goku or Vegeta Black like always. And not only will this be a nice change of pace, but this one also has an explanation behind it so it's not just something I'm pulling out of my ass. I mean if we're being fair here, Dragon Ball always does like to pull stuff out of thin air and have a lot of ass pulls in it, so even if you want to consider that, I guess it's kind of fitting. Okay, enough kidding around. Trunks arrives back in the past and is found by Bulma, who gets Goku and Vegeta to come over to help him. Trunks is glad to see these two, and that means he's safe and has made it back to the past, with other people like Cell, Gohan, Beerus, Whis, and everyone else arriving as well to see what's happening. Trunks explains why he's back here, and how he's facing another threat in the future. However, the threat is someone he didn't really expect. Someone who he knows for a fact died. The reason he knows that this person should be dead is because it was someone Trunks killed on his own, and he doesn't think it's someone different either. He thinks it's the same person somehow having had to come back to life. Out of nowhere, a portal appears in the sky. The villain is revealed, with Trunks knowing it must be the person he suspected. Goku, Vegeta, and everyone are equally shocked to find out who the villain actually is. Trunks can only mutter one word. Actually, a number. 17. The same android that Trunks once killed is back. Android 17. Although, his attire is a little bit different, but he's very much malicious and looks exactly like that same android that Trunks once killed. Obviously, you guys all know this is actually Zamasu, but the group just assumes it's future 17 again. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Of all the people, Zamasu took 17's body? Why? Well, I could hear you in the comments already, but I do have a reasoning behind it. It's not just to spice things up. Zamasu was watching the Universe 6 tournament and was appalled by what he saw. Two Saiyans using godly powers, and then two androids there that were made by humans trying to play god and create life forms. He is disgusted by this. Not only did these mortals make a mockery of godly powers, but now, they're trying to play God and create androids and trying to create their own life forms? Creating things is a job of the Kais. Why are these mortals doing it? Seeing these androids gets him even angrier than before. Zamasu this time ends up stealing the body of Seventeen, or Lapis in this scenario. But why him? Well, he didn't see Goku fight much, so he doesn't really have any reason to steal his body. And for Cell, Cell didn't fight at all either, so Zamasu doesn't care too much about him. Vegeta showed off great power, and he has the ability to get stronger as he fights, 
although he seems to have limitations in terms of maintaining his high power for a long time. On the other hand, Lapis is there, who is close to the strength of Vegeta, and yeah, he's a little bit behind and he doesn't have the ability to get Zenkai's, but he has infinite energy and stamina, which is a huge plus. It's definitely not something to underestimate. It's a tough choice, but Zamasu ends up stealing the body of Lapis. He didn't steal Goku's body just due to the fact that he was using godly powers. A big part of it mainly is due to the ability that Saiyans have to grow stronger. He explained this himself. It wouldn't really make much sense to do the Zero Mortals plan if he stole Immortal's body without any other reasoning behind it. It's not like he stole Goku's body just for fun. He had a reasoning behind it. So it's pretty much the same here except it's for Lapis. He could fight at full power all the time, not worrying about transformations or whatever. And besides, Zamasu considers androids like Lapis and Cell monstrosities due to how he viewed them as the results of humans playing God. He doesn't even really see them as pure mortals like someone like Goku or Vegeta. In his eyes, they may as well not even be human at all. So this is a bit better than stealing the body of someone like Vegeta. But again, that's not even the main reason. It's all because of the fact that he has infinite stamina, much like how he stole Goku's body for Zenkai's, and that is a very valuable thing to have in a fight. But yeah, this is definitely 17 alright. His clothes look a little different, and he has an earring on and a ring for some reason that no one really knows why. Well, Beerus and Whis are quick to pick up on it, but no one else really notices or questions it yet. Like I said though, no one knows this is Zamasu, they're just really confused. And this works in Zamasu's favor because they don't even suspect that it's someone stealing someone else's body. They just think Seventeen is alive again from the future somehow. But Beerus and Whis did pick up on the fact that he has a Patara earring on one ear, and he has the time ring. So they get very suspicious. This might not be Seventeen like everyone's suspecting. It might be someone entirely different, or even a new android in general. But we're gonna leave all that for the next part, and see what they'll do to actually find out the actual origins behind this so-called 17 Black, I guess? I don't know, that's kind of a weird name. There's no reason for anyone to call him Black. They just think that he's Android 17 from the future, and they just call him that. It's not even confusing for them because, well, 17 doesn't exist in their timeline, it's only Lapis. Okay, I'm going off on a tangent, so let's end this part here. So what did you guys think about this part, and what do you think will happen next? How will the future Trunks arc go now that all these different events happened? How do you think Zamasu will be defeated this time? Leave all your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below, and I'll be sure to check them out and get an idea of what you guys think. As usual, if you guys liked the video, why not drop a like, as well as subscribing if you haven't already, and hit the bell icon for notifications about future parts of this what if, or any other videos of mine. Doing that will ensure that you won't miss them, as long as YouTube actually recommends them to you, because, you know, sometimes they don't always do that. But yeah, besides that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and as always, thank you for watching. I'll see you on the next part.